on, you know, you and I were talking um, while I while you're on your way to Nashville, going to see our girl Casey uh-huh. Musgraves. Oh, it was so awesome! Oh my gosh, was it everything you wanted it to be? Yes, and I think that I was the only straight person in the crowd, and I loved it. <laughs> yes, Queen. Yeah, I loved it. Like we were surrounded by, I mean, like we we got like an extra wristband or something. I was surrounded by like girls and gays, and I was like, yeah, this is my scene. Yeah, <laughs> my people. But, yeah. So like someone didn't have like the wristband, they were so bummed out. And I was like, you know what? Take mine. I, you know, I, I love. It. I just gave him my <laughs> wristband or something like a memorabilia thing. So I just gave it to him. But uh, it was it was a lot of fun. She's so incredible. Here's my question though: What did you wear? Did you put on like a fancy Casey Musgraves outfit? Because she really brings the fashion. And I feel like if you wanted to throw in a tassel, maybe a sequin, that would have been the the yeah. setting for it. I don't know. I remember I just wore jeans and a, a t-shirt, I think. I can't remember. M- Maria, she dressed up for sure. She wore like the Reba jacket with the tassels down and I had to take like seven boomerangs of her doing a spin. <laughs> you got to get it right. You got to yeah. get it right. Yeah, um, she dressed up for sure. How was it be like, that was your guys' first trip away in like yeah. eight years, you said. How was yeah. it? Her first trip since, I mean, you know, she's gone to WrestleMania with me and she's, you know, done some of those things. But like, you know, at WrestleMania, you still have signings and, you know, matches and stuff like that. So we've been away before, but we've never had uh, time by ourselves. Oh, babe, she, there she is. She brings is she me over call. there? I, we're going to be, I definitely would like Maria to come be a part of this at some point. Hi. <laughs> Rick Flair. How are you? Hi, Good. Good. Oh my God. I, 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 we need to like, well, I mean, you're here now. Let's just have you on for the time being. Right. Cause I, I want to know about the romance. Oh, oh. the romance. Let's oh, see. pull up a chair. I really like getting into like, you know, we had been talking earlier, but it's like, we can talk about wrestling and blah, blah, blah. We'll get to some of that stuff. But like, I love the family stuff. I love knowing about like you as a human being and I know family is obviously such an important thing to you. You are like that dude that I feel like the show ends and you are hightailing it out of there to get back home. Has yeah, it's been that way for you. Uh, yeah, uh, for, for WWE, for sure. Like, um, I don't know. I, I always felt guilty at WWE because not, not to them, but to them mm-hmm. because I was gone so much. And uh, so I would always find the fastest or the, the, the earliest flights out whether I had sleep or not, I wanted, I still do find the earliest flights out because I wanted to get home because like, I don't know, like it's cool to be able to take care of them through my dream and, and make this money and stuff like that. But ultimately, especially for Finley, she's, she's, she's fucking great. Like the best human being <laughs> in the world, yeah. but Finley only know, or at least then she only knew that daddy wasn't home, you know? And I could tell her a million times when I'm going to work so, you know, you can stay here with mom or so we can have this house or whatever. I could tell her that a million times, but still, all she knows is daddy's leaving again. Yeah. And it's like, so hard for me then. Uh, but yeah, just just Wednesday night, as soon as I was fil- finished filming, I, I changed my flight to, a, to an 8 p.m. flight and flew home uh, straight to Asheville. And uh, I don't know. It's just, yeah. I know how lucky I am and how fortunate I am to have what I have in her, um, you know, our, our whole relationship, I'm taking up this whole conversation now. You didn't even get to talk to her. <laughs> but it's all right. Whole, well, I'll, I'll be bringing Maria into this real yeah. soon. <laughs> uh, but our whole relationship has been like that. Like, I don't know, uh, when we first met, um, I was in college, but I was paying for my own college. So I had like three jobs, two or three jobs at a time. Um, and one job was opening up a vitamin store where I would go all day and I'd leave that job and go to, uh, my next job, which was a uh, DJ, I was a DJ at nighttime, and uh, yeah, yeah, and so I DJ the biggest bar in town. It was a big, huge party bar. Oh, and there's Tolly. There's all. <laughs> um, and like, she always was so supportive. She never complained. You know, 18 credit hours of school and three jobs and wrestling. Um, and then at my other my my job until 3 a.m. I was surrounded by girls and she never ever questioned me never cared you know what I mean and I could never bother her at least I don't think it did no (laughs) and so like she's been prepped for this life but man she's never once complained how did you guys meet what's the origin story who swooned who well Jesus Uh, (laughs) 
Well, um, her her best friend worked with me at the, the, the club downtown. She was the door girl. And um, one day Maria came in and that's how we met. And um, then me and my buddies went out a couple of, I don't know, weeks later. And uh, I saw her roommate at a bar and she was uh, inebriated. And it was only like 5 p.m. And I was like, hey, let's, I'll take you home. And so me and my buddies took her to the to the uh, her apartment, which is, she lived with Maria. Maria was there. She had literally just broken up with her boyfriend. And I was like, hey, we're going to go out if you'd like to come with us. And she said, you know what? I'm going to come with you. And so she comes with us. And we go out downtown. We have fun. And uh, long story short, I courted her for like six months. And she said no for six straight months. <laughs> Literally, no. I was figuring shit out, you know? Yeah, she was in college. She was a new free woman. She, you know, <laughs> she had to check out the scene. Well, yeah. And she, yeah, she just said no for six months. And um, I said, okay, well, look, I love you so much that it's, this was like in December. I was like, it's either 0% or 100%. That was my exact words. And she said, okay, it's 0%. I was like, oh my God, why not do Oh my so God. You're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> yeah. Um, so she moved back to Hendersonville, uh, where, which is kind of where we live now. And um, I was still in uh, Wilmington, where I was going to college or where I finished college. And she uh, she called me one day. She was driving back, and she said, "I can't live without you. I love you so much." Driving four hours, five hours from Hendersonville to Wilmington just to come and tell me she loved me. And she came in the door. And we embraced. And I fucking knocked all the stuff off. <laughs> Professor, and he put her up there and we started making out and he said all right well i've got to go back home and so she left right after that and but then i moved back and then she moved back yeah. and we moved in with each other like almost immediately and, yeah oh and my god how long ago was that how long have you guys been together 13 years 13 years yeah. we just celebrated oh our goodness. 14th valentine's day together <laughs> wow oh my god very impressive <laughs> yeah. that's great Maria, did you know what you were getting into? I mean, when this relationship started, I mean, you know, he talks about your patience and your trust in him and now this journey that you guys have been on and like through thick and thin, I mean, as we sign up for when we say those vows. Yeah, yeah so I think, well, when initially when he told me that he wrestled, I was like, good, well, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> we'll see. And, you know, and then I went to one of his first shows. It was at like an armory. Oh or my gosh. First show she ever went to. And I was like, holy shit, like this is real deal. Like he's serious and he's really talented. And so then, you know, and he always talked about wanting to get signed somewhere and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I just kind of. Tell them what happened with the first show. I don't remember. Oh, someone had to carry, or like take us out or something. Yeah. Like, so like I always off, prided but... myself and I still kind of do. On trying to like get people to fight me, I love it. I love <laughs> off of that. And so the first show she ever went to, three sets of fans, different fans that didn't know each other, they jumped the guardrail rail to fight me. This is the first time she ever saw it. The police had to take me to the locker room. These fans and their families barged into the locker room. They had to push them out, and then the police had to escort us to our car. And this is in front of like I don't know, two hundred people. Right, it's like a tiny little. <laughs> and she's like, what? <laughs> you must have felt like a little extra like moxie having you know having your woman there in the project i gotta really show her what this is all about yeah, I it guess. was a real show yeah i guess so. yeah oh my gosh so then, I went from there and we um, got me yeah. the next day drove to tampa for so. i got signed so we yeah we we got engaged at the end of 2011 no, 2010, and we scheduled our, our uh, wedding date as uh, September the 16th, 2012, and um, wait, no. No, it's fall. 2011, anyway, yeah. 2011, we <laughs> 2012, we, were, we scheduled to, to get married, and like Kenny and Seaman, um, he called, and he was like, okay, we're going to offer you this contract. This is the start date. And I was like, oh, man, that's the day after my wedding. We have a honeymoon scheduled. Can I please have you know, some time off. Oh yeah, that's not a problem. We'll, we'll make sure to get it to you. So he calls me a week before my wedding. He says, I just want to make sure everything's in place. You're good to go. Yes, sir. I can't wait. Good to go. I said, okay, so you'll be starting on September the 17th. I said, oh man, you remember you, you told me I could have two weeks off for my honeymoon. He said, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Um, how is a day? And I was like, oh my God, this is my first, my only break. 
And so it was like, yeah, I, I, let me talk to my wife. And so I asked her and her exact words, she may not remember, her exact words were, I don't care what we do as long as we get married. I was like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> yes. Woman, you know, yeah. so yeah, we got married on the 16th uh, and drove on the 17th and started on the 18th crazy it is funny how that happens because like when john and i got married i mean we just like we knew that we were gonna get married that we had been in reno i was with him at live events and we were like just like in the town like a little bit hung over walking around we're like let's go to the courthouse and get our marriage license because we're in the state of nevada that way we know we want to get married we can just do it and call it a day so of course six months after that it's like burning a hole in my pocket i'm like are we gonna do this or like what <laughs> <laughs> we ended up getting married, um, but yeah, we had to wait. Oh, I guess probably well at least six months, I would say, until we finally got to go on our honeymoon. I mean, you know the way that schedules; it's like impossible to actually get proper time off, and depending on what your storyline is and what's going on, and blah blah blah. Um, so yeah, we're kind of just yet. along for the ride, huh? We still haven't gone on our honeymoon yet. <laughs> Oh my God, you owe her, you owe her. You talked about WWE and having that big break. Um, what, what were like the moments prior to that and actually having that opportunity come to fruition for you? Dude, it's so crazy because like, it's one of those things where, you know, you hear someone say, you just don't care anymore and it'll happen. Yeah. So um, I got an opportunity to go to Japan and I went to Japan and worked for like a month or a month and a half or something. And uh, Japan? No, no, no. It was zero one. Okay. And um, when I was over, while I was over in Japan, I said, you know what? Like, I'm going to quit wrestling. Uh, I'm going to quit wrestling, use my degree, get a real job. And because I just want to be with her. And I want to take care of her for the rest of my life. And so I was going to quit wrestling at the end of that year. And I don't know how, but Regal got some of my footage and he found out about me and he called me and asked me to come do an extra spot. And I did. Funny enough, uh, it was the first time I'd ever really, I mean, we had met before, but we had never like conversed with, with cash. And um, we met there and they put us in the ring together. And they said, we don't know how long you're, you're going to go. We'll just tell you when to stop or when to wrap it up. But just keep going until. So the first two matches went and we didn't, even, me and Dan, we didn't even have time to talk about anything. But first two matches went and um, they cut the guys off after two minutes or four minutes or whatever. So we got in the ring and we just started going. And uh, and then we kept going and going and going and they never stopped. And Scott Armstrong was like, keep going. They love it, keep going. And we went like 15 minutes and um, finally, we, you know, we wrapped it up, went home. And right after that, I got the, the contract and um, signed it, <laughs> signed it for less money than I was making at my real job. And <laughs> What was your job at the time? So I was a, I was sti uh, still a manager for a vitamin shop, okay. but like incredible benefits, great pay. And then I was still the DJ too at nighttime, which was all cash. Again, great pay. Um, no future there, but like still it was, it was, it was awesome money. Um, and I, WWE signed us for, or signed me for like $40,000 a year or something. And. Yeah, so we picked up everything and left and went there. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So crazy. Like the way that you jump gonna... out of here. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out with us a bit. Thank you. It's so it is like crazy though, that like journey of you know, finally making that thing come together. And I mean, look at I mean it's it's really inspiring to see like what you guys were able to do in WWE, now what you guys are doing in AEW. Um, what about that moment of you guys wanting to bet on yourselves and for you to leave WWE and look for another opportunity? Because you guys didn't know, like, you guys weren't going straight to AEW when you asked for your releases. No. So, I mean, I don't know. Money is, is incredible. Um, but I talked to my grandma and I was like, you know, telling her my issues. And um, I was I was like, I'm just not happy, but the money is great, blah, blah, blah. And her exact words to me were, how much money do you really need? I was like, oh my God. That was like such an eye-opening experience yeah. for me. My parents never had money, but they always made things work for us. And, you know, I could do the same and, you know, I'm college educated and, you know, two degrees and stuff like that. And so I was like, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. And we just, I don't know, it it's, sounds like I'm bitter, but I'm not at all. We just weren't happy. Um, yeah. They, 
not just us, but they were not giving any of the tag teams the opportunities we thought that it deserved. Um, and we knew we would be stuck at a certain position if we stayed there. And um, man, for years and years and years and years, like since I, I can remember, I have prayed every single night to, to be a professional wrestler. And um, I take it very, very seriously. And knowing that they weren't going to give us the opportunities um, that we thought we, we deserved, uh, I, I knew we just had to, to get out of there and, and make a name for ourselves. So we talked about it, um, and they kept throwing more mo money at us, more and more money. And we said no for a very long time. Um, and my wife was having health problems. And so I told them, like, look, not only do I not want to stay, I want to be home more with my wife. This is obviously before the pandemic. Yeah. I want to be home with my wife because she's going through some health issues and uh, I don't want to be on the road. I want to be here with her, um, you know, and then the pandemic hit. Uh, they called us and they said, look, we know you want out. Your contracts are up in, you know, two months or whatever, but they were going to extend your contract because of your injury until August. And, uh, but the out is all these, um, all these trademarks you have, if you sign them over to us, uh, we will let you have your release, no 90 days, and we'll give it to you today. And so we thought about it, uh, me and Dan called each other and we said, let's just, we had spent like 10 or $20,000 in trademarks. Uh, one of those is like FTR, Shadow Machine, uh, No Flips, Just Fist, all this stuff. Yeah. Um, that's stuff that we came up with, not them. And, yeah. uh, but we were like, you know what? We want out so bad. We're just unhappy. Uh, just let them have it. It's just money. Yeah. Um, we called back and said, you can have all the trademarks. Um, just please give us our release. And they did. So. Wow. So what was the time in between like for you guys while you were waiting to see what the opportunities were going to look like either on the indie scene or what was going to happen with AEW? Um, almost immediately. Uh, yeah. As far as after the re release. I mean, um, you know, we had had talks with uh, Cody and, you know, um, and through Cody, we had, had talks with um, Tony. So from the time that we asked for a release to the year later, um, we knew there was an opportunity for us. So we weren't worried or anything, but um, it was kind of scary because the pandemic had just hit. Yeah. But, uh, we were just so, um, so unhappy. Um, and I never wanted to get to the point where I wasn't happy and bringing it home, you know? For sure. So I I had to get out before that. Yes. You know, happened. Yeah, no doubt. I know when you're so passionate about something, you got to kind of find a way to still keep that light and fun and to still enjoy that. Cause as soon as that's gone, it gets yeah. rough out there for sure. Um, let's take things back to your time in college. Um, you mentioned, you know, obviously you were there, you're playing football. You had a bunch of different jobs. How were you making all the ends meet while also still pursuing wrestling? I don't know. I really don't know. My wife and I talk about it all the time. Like we have no idea how I made it work. And that, that sounds like I'm patting myself on the back and I'm really not. Uh, but I have, no, I just, I don't know. I just, it just happened, you know, like um, you would wake up every morning or I'd wake up every morning and say, okay, go to this job, get through this job. All right, go home, change clothes. Now let's go into this job. All right. Uh, let's, you know, let's do, how many hours of school you need to do. Um, and, you know, I graduated, eventually graduated from UNCW. So that took a little bit of pressure off of me. Um, yeah. And then I would work, you know, until 3 a.m. and then wake up the next morning and do it all over again. Uh, I have no idea. Um, other than I, uh, I knew I had to finish college. I promised my dad that, but also like I knew I had to finish college because I wanted to provide the best life for her that I possibly could. Yeah. Um, and so that was my, like, that, that was my, that's how I got myself through college. And then after that, I was like, shit, I just want to make it to wrestling somehow. And so I had to pay the bills uh, and do all this traveling and stuff, but also get back in time for the next morning for uh, work. Um, so I don't know. It just, I just, I don't know. It just became routine, I guess. Yeah, I know. It's, it is like that weird thing when you're like in, it's like you're in the eye of the storm and you just put your head down and you just do whatever it is that you have to do. I mean, whether it's doing a bunch of different jobs, losing sleep, um, all that stuff, while also having to worry about like 
what you're eating and all these different things that you have to worry about as a wrestler. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a tall order, but, but here we are. <laughs> you yep. overcame it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Dude. And like, so I left that part of my life and entered WWE and it was the exact same thing. And it only got, you know, once yeah. I got on the road, uh, even with the next team, once I got on the road, like you just got to the next town, you would sleep for like five hours, four or five hours, go to the gym, then eat, then, you know, go to the, go to the show, get finished with the show, drive three hours to the next town. And you just, you just did it every single day. It's yeah, it's, it's gnarly. It's definitely not for everybody. Um, okay. So before college in high school, I know that you've talked about this before, but I'm not sure how in depth you've gone with it, but you suffered from bulimia. What, yeah, was, uh, what, what was that like experience like for you? Like, how did that start? Yeah. Uh, so it was right after high school. Um, actually I got out of high school. So I, was, I played high school football and, you know, I was just, you know, eating whatever because I was a lineman. So I was trying to get, you know, big, um, and I got to like, I don't know, 285 pounds on a wow. five frame, you know, I'd always been a big kid, but you know, uh, I just got really, really, really big. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and then I continued to eat that way as a lineman throughout after, after high school. Um, and so without that extra physical activity, I just put on so much weight and, uh, I was embarrassed and, um, I was just ashamed and, I had a buddy uh, who moved in with me and my dad, I don't know, maybe a year before that, because um, he had some family problems at home and he'd come live with us. And uh, he was overweight too. And uh, one day I called him doing it outside. And I was like, hey, what, what the fuck are you doing? And he said, I'm so sorry, man, but you know this. And I said, well, why are you doing it? Well, to help me lose weight. I said, oh. I said, does it work? He said, well, I went from this weight to this weight. And so uh, I started doing it too and um, working out and trying to get in the best shape, you know, for wrestling um, or for wrestling school. And uh, it just, again, something that became routine. You know, I didn't think it was a problem or an issue. Um, and I've never been like, a, a, like addiction's never been a problem for me. So thankfully I was able to just stop. But, um, uh, it got really bad to a point like I was every single day at the end of the day, I would go outside and just so my dad couldn't hear me and I would just throw up uh, as much as I could. I would, I would binge eat and go outside and throw up. And uh, it was, I don't know. It just became again, like I said, routine. Yeah. Uh, I was like, Holy shit. I've got to stop this. This is not good. How long did that go on for? Oh my God. Uh, maybe six months. Yeah. Well, um, again, it didn't, uh, thankfully I'm not, uh, addiction is not something that's, that's, um, uh, bothers me, but, uh, I was able to just say, okay, stop. That's enough. You're, 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 you're going to fuck your life up, yeah. you know, but still, um, and it was, it was very scary when I realized like, I can't, uh, I can't go a day without doing this, you know, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, I, uh, the the body dysmorphia like how i viewed myself and how embarrassed i was of myself and then i was embarrassed of what i was doing you know and then it would just become this cycle thing because um i was thinking okay well if i can get to this weight i'll stop you know and then i cannot be embarrassed about anything and then you get like well, okay 10 more or whatever 10 more pounds so you keep doing it um and it just never i don't know nothing is ever good enough what did that do to your body doing that for that period of time? Like, did it exhaust you or like, like I don't what think I, sort of the ramifications of that? I don't think I noticed any like exhaustion because I was super young then. So you've got, you know, you've got all this energy and, and you know, um, but like, uh, I don't know. I, I didn't, I would lose the weight, but um, I don't know, like my, the body dysmorphia would never go away because one, because you've got it stuck in your head, but two, like when you're doing that, you're not getting any nutrients in your body. So as hard as I was working out, I was never building any muscle mass. So I got, you know, what's called skinny fat now. Who, who even knows what that is, but you I'm know, that's skinny fat currently having a baby. will do that to you. <laughs> Here I Me? am. Well, I'm not, I didn't have a baby, but I'm the same. I'm skinny fat. <laughs> who knows who even cares what that is? You know what I mean? Who cares? Totally. Uh, 
but but like my body would get i don't know to my my opinion i would look worse uh than i than when i was actually heavy and so i was like i gotta keep going gotta keep going so more than like physically it it just i can wreck me mentally yeah yeah i mean the mental aspect of that okay so you've mentioned body dysmorphia a few times and it's funny because i i like you and I were talking prior to this and I just, I can't imagine somebody kind of not having body dysmorphia to some degree. Like, I feel like I never know what I look like. I can never tell if I'm like, am I fat? Am I athletic? Am I skinny? Like, I just have no concept of what I look like sometimes. I'm like, do other people feel that way? Like they must. I I don't know. I find it, it's very confusing. When did that start to happen for you to have that, that body dysmorphia kind of kick in? I got, uh, you know, right after football. I mean, and I did, I gained a lot of weight. And so I would wear the same clothes that I had and they were like super tight, but I was too like prideful to go buy bigger clothes. Yeah. And so I'd see myself in the mirror and I'd think, oh my gosh, what, what's going on with me? And, and I had no, I mean, I'm from a very small town in North Carolina, you know, and so we're not the most health conscious, um, you know, in, in that little bit of that little bitty town. And so I had no clue about like carbs and fats and, you know, uh, nutrition and things like that. I just ate to eat, you know, and my dad, mom would cook and I would just, just eat it until I was full. Um, and so, it, you know, that's when I started like experiencing the body of smorphy. I never had it in high school. Um, you know, I would get called fat in high school, but, uh, you know, but like that never, ever bothered me for some reason that never bothered me. Uh, but like right after high school, it was, I don't know, it got really, really bad. And that's when I started um, experiencing the, 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 the mental body dysmorphia uh, thing. And then, um, you know, so now I've, I've gone from this 280 pound, almost 300 pound fat guy. And um, I, I've lost all this weight. And so now I have this uh, excess skin that hangs, you know, as disgusting as it sounds. I hate even talking about it, but like I have this excess skin around my belly um, that I have to have surgery to get rid of, but you know, with our schedule, we can't do that. Yeah. And so I get on social media as well. And then, you, you know, people see me in my trunks and, you know, they don't know what I've been through, what I've, what happened or they, they just, you know, see this and I'm like, Oh my God, how can this, you know, th- th- he looks like this. No wonder he's, you know, not in the main event or whatever, you know, um, so you read that stuff and you know, no one knows. They don't know. Yeah how much they're affecting a person. Um, and I can let most of it slide off my back, but then some days, you know, some days it's like, holy I mean, shit. It I'm gets first. you. Yeah. It's like, I'm waking up every morning. I'm doing this fasting thing. I'm, you know, busting my ass in the gym. I'm trying to eat right. You know, and this one person, this one person says something about me and I'm like, Oh my God, like I'm trying here, you know, just give me a chance. I know. It's so horrible when that happens. Like, uh, you know, even like, you know, for myself, just being like a woman on television, my weight fluctuates or something and people are fucking on it right away. It's like, guys, calm down. Like it happens. People's yeah. weight's going to fluctuate. It's hard, especially when you go from like aging on television and being on TV for a certain amount of time. It's like, yeah, my weight's going to fluctuate. My look is going to change. Like that's always going to be a part of it. And it's like this weird expectation that everybody has for you to just always look the same, always be consistent, to always be super, super regimented about how you look, what your exercise is, what your eating is like. It's impossible to stay on top of while also just like maintaining some semblance of like happiness. Yeah, exactly. And, and I don't know, like you can, you, you can try to, to ignore it, uh, but God, it's always there. It's always there. I, know. And I can't say that it, bothers me all the time, but then I can't, I can, I can't also say that it doesn't bother me at all. Yeah. Uh, you feel like less of a man for saying, it, you know, but like, um, also it's like, guys, fuck it. I'm, I'm, I'm working as hard as I can in the ring. You know, I'm, I'm trying to be the best wrestler in the world. That's my, that's what I want to do. Um, and sometimes I think I'm doing that just so you ignore the fact that I don't have the best body, you know? Uh, right. so it's, uh, you know, it's a never ending cycle, especially on social media. How much does being in the wrestling world as well kind of obviously feed into that for those reasons? I mean, you see these guys that 
are shredded all the time. And there, there is truly a, a very broad array of different body types in wrestling, especially now. Um, but is that still something like, do you think about that stuff a lot? Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, it, I had to get to a point where I told myself uh, until you get injured again and you can take time off and have this surgery, uh, you're never going to look like, you know, I've never gonna look Bobby Roode, who is in incredible shape, you know. Uh, Bobby Roode. Yeah, I know he's killing it for all of us. He's he's like 40 for everybody. I remember yeah. being on a plane with him one time, and yeah, I was like watching to see if Bobby got the snacks on the plane. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> no way, no way. He is so regimented. He's he's so disciplined. Him and Chad Gable both. It's like God, come yeah, on. Guys. I know. Help. Lighten up, guys. Have a fucking chicken sandwich. But, uh, you, know? you know what? Yeah. All these internet people, as soon as I get injured again and have this surgery, like I'm gonna come back and you better apologize to my ass. Coming back hard. How, so you've looked into this surgery already, obviously. Oh, I've looked into it for years and years and years. I just we've, you know, we have. Bef- when I got when we got injured uh, in 2008, 17, we got called up. Uh, that's where my bicep. I just had no money, so I couldn't do it then. Right. Uh, and then, you know, I have, we've been nonstop since 2017, um, literally never, you know, this is the least I've worked here in AEW, um, but still it's nonstop. Go, 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 go. It's so crazy. Just like how hard people are on other people about their bodies. Like as if like, we shouldn't all just be applauding you for the work that you have done to be healthy and to get your body to where it is. But to imagine like, well, okay, you did this one thing. Why can we not have it be absolutely perfect? It's such a weird expectation that we put on other people or that other people put on you. It's yeah. like, it's so, it's such a vicious cycle. It's so crazy. Instead of being like, holy shit, you did this thing. Like, hell yeah. Like how inspirational to other people that could be in that situation, trying to lose that weight and trying to get, you know, the health side of it more than anything. But it's this, this aesthetic side of it that comes with it. That's so vicious. Yeah. And, and, and like for the, you know, for example, the halftime show 50 cent, I thought it looked great, you know, and there's so many people making fun of him. Uh, I'm like, man, you know, like, what if that's affecting him? What if he worked his ass off to get into that shape for that one moment and you guys are wrecking it for him? You know, I, I don't understand. I've never understood it. Um, and I've tried to make sure that I teach my daughter not to be that way. But also, I, I don't want her to know how regimented I try to be on my, my uh, nutrition and my food. I don't want her to know either because I don't want her to have that expectation that she has to grow up and do the same thing. Like that's the main reason besides the shitty people that are in the business. That's the main reason I don't want her to be a wrestler is because I don't want her to have to go through that. Like the bumps and the bruises and stuff, you know, whatever. Um, But like dealing with uh, self image and, and you know, how you have to meet people's expectations. I never, I mean, she's going to have to, but I never want her to to think about that or go through that, you know? Or yeah, worry. Especially, yeah, especially like not at home. And that's one of those things I find. Um, I mean, I have a daughter as well. She's only eight months. But those are the things that you think about and the, the society that we're bringing our kids up in. Like, I think all the time if I have my like phone out, if she were to see like the filters that we put on our faces for her to feel like, oh, just her regular beautiful face is not enough. And we need to add this contour. We need to have our nose thinned out or our lips plumped a little bit more like that shit just rattles my brain. And I can't imagine a kid growing up like that. Cause we didn't have to grow up like that. We weren't under the microscope in that way. We didn't strive for this perfection the way that, that kids do now. It's such a scary thing to imagine with a daughter. It scares me to think, uh, it almost makes me emotional to think that she's going to have to deal with that. And, yeah. you know, I never want her to, to worry or, think she has to eat a certain way or look a certain way or do a certain thing to, to be accepted or you know, it's, I don't know. Yeah. It's having um, kids. Scary, man. Oh my God. I know. It's like, not only do we have to make sure that like we're doing everything right and yeah. teaching them the right lessons and giving them the morals and making them great human beings, but then you got to worry about all of these outside factors that unfortunately we just can't control. It's like, Oh my yeah. God. Like me as a, you know, 
I hate when people put connotations on Southerners as far as like us being that we're stupid or, or whatever. I hate that. But there, there are connotations that we deserve as Southerners. And so like uh, the way that I was raised I, I, um, or things like I heard uh, in the South, like I, I try to purposely as a, as a parent now, I try to purposely filter before I let things come out because I don't want her to, even if it's nothing, um, nothing bad, I don't want her to think like I'm judging someone uh, because of, because of the way they look or uh, how, how big they are or like sound like, or what they're driving or what they're wearing. So like, I, I'm always on a constant um, filter around her. So she knows like, man, judging is, uh, it, you know, it's, it's the worst thing you could possibly do. I think. Yeah. What is your relationship like with your daughter? Oh my God. Uh, so uh, less than a week ago, Maria and I were sitting on the couch and we were drinking coffee and Maria is so fucking weird. Like she is so <laughs> weird. Sings, and, or, you know, to, to Finley. And so, um, then was having breakfast and we we're having coffee and I was laughing at Maria being an idiot. And, uh, and fin Maria said, Finley, who, who is the cool parent between me and your dad? And she said, oh, I don't want to answer that. Please don't make me answer that. And we were like, no, no, we're not going to get mad, babe. Just who, who, if you had to introduce your friends to one of the parents, who would it be? And she said, oh, my God, Ugh, dad. And Maria, her mouth dropped. And, I, and she could not believe it. And that's because I have the night, like the, the big black truck or whatever. And she's like, well, yeah, that. I was like, is it because dad's on TV? Yeah, but also you're just kind of cool. And I was like, oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, it's, it, I mean, she is the easiest. The other day she said, she said, um, dad, what, have I ever done anything bad? And I was like, no, you've never done anything bad. She said, well, what about the time that I, I drew on the floor? She drew on our hardwood floors years ago, like two, two years ago. I was like, yeah, well, that, that's not bad. Like you, you've never done anything bad. No, you're not bad. And I started thinking about it. And I was like, oh my God, my daughter has never said a bad thing about someone or like been mean to someone in public, maybe behind my back. I don't know. But like I'm, she's never gotten in trouble at school or um, because they do enrichment classes for all the homeschool people or she's never gotten in trouble at soccer. Um, she's just got like this pure and I'm sure we all as parents think this way, but she has this pure heart of gold, like dance class on Tuesday, Tuesday night. Uh, I went to pick her up and we have to stand outside while we pick her up. And one of uh, her dance colleagues got an area. Her dance colleague. Is that what you call them? <laughs> I Whatever. mean, I guess so. <laughs> I was a dance dad. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> her friend got an aerial in class, right? And she was a first ever perfect aerial. Um, and then she tried to do it again and she, cause she wanted to show one of the teachers and she couldn't do it. And then she couldn't do it. She kept continued and she could not do it again. And she was so upset. Uh, this, this friend was and everyone left class and I was like, where is Finley? It's five minutes after dance is over. And I walk in and like, she's sitting with this girl who was crying with the teacher. And I like took a picture of it and sent it to Maria. And I was like, we have the sweetest kid in the world because she was just like letting the girl know it's okay. You know, next week you'll get it. And it's, you know, not a big deal. And, uh, she's the best. So I try to Girl. find line of like when to discipline her and how to discipline her and stuff yeah. like that, you know, uh, because I don't want to, I don't ever want her to think like I'm a mean dad, but, <laughs> but like let her know, you know, you gotta, you gotta also follow the rules too. Yeah. So, know, oh my parent. gosh. Yeah. Parenting is a, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm obviously not there yet. I mean, my kid just wants to like inspect every little thing right now. So I'm just merely trying to keep her safe at this point. Um, but yeah, once it's like, you know, instilling some values and watching them become these little humans, it's, it's so cool. It's such a, it's such a cool thing to get to do. I highly recommend it. You guys highly oh, yeah. recommend. Oh my gosh. I told Sammy Zane the same thing. I was like, dude, you got to get it before he, before he had his baby. I was like, yeah. you got it, man you got to get a kid he's like oh, i'm not sure <laughs> i was like you gotta do it Rami. it's the greatest thing in the world and his wife got pregnant he immediately went well, immediately text me but he texts me like afterwards and he said i can't wait if you got any advice please let me know um he had the kid we talked and he said you're right you were right this this whole time i wondered how you could be so infatuated with your daughter and you were exactly right 
I know you don't you don't know until it's you because yep. anyone can tell you what it's like and it's like all right whatever whatever if you're not mentally there you're not mentally there until you're put in that spot and you're like oh my god my heart is going to explode and I mean, you cannot is. believe that this person exists yeah yeah That's so cool um okay so on a different note entirely um you have struggled with some anxiety uh, in the in like the recent past yeah. Is it something you're still kind of going through or is this something you've overcome to a degree no. where? Dude, I don't know if you ever overcome, you know, yeah. um, and, but, but again, I'm so new to it. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I think I still struggle with it. Uh, I feel like, but. Um, How did it start? What, what kind of, what, the thing with anxiety, like you and I had talked about this before, like my anxiety is different than what yours is. Mine truly stems from like really bad, like claustrophobia being on a plane like that makes me like I will fucking shoot through like the roof of a plane to like get out of it like do, going into like a lavatory on a plane is my fucking nightmare no Dude. thank you uh or, no or like so being stuck in in like an elevator or something that makes me like it makes me start to sweat even to talk about it. I can't even think about it but that's the kind of anxiety that I get and it sprung from one specific moment um, but for you, what was sort of the tipping point that made this all kind of unfold? So the tipping point was, was, was easy for me to, to, to uh, pinpoint, I guess. It was June the 5th. I was, we, were in, um, we were in Jacksonville, Florida. I was in a hotel room, and uh, I just couldn't go to sleep. I had so much stuff on my mind. I couldn't go to sleep, and I, I, I didn't sleep at all. And I was like calling Marie. I was freaking out and like, she she was asleep and it was like six in the morning and I'm walking around the hotel outside and it just I'd never experienced this before in my life and so I'm, I'm freaking out and I finally uh, get back to my room and I fall asleep for like two hours um, at like seven in the morning and I wake up and I call her and I was like oh my god I, you know last night I was freaking out I couldn't sleep and you know it was, my heart was racing I didn't know what's going on um, tonight I hope's better you know and so the night came again and I couldn't go to sleep again. And I was, you know, it's like you, you start to spiral because you don't start thinking about it. Um, and so I was like, okay, God, what the, I, I don't know what's going on. I can't sleep. I think I slept maybe that night, maybe three hours. Um, and so I was like, okay, I just want to go home. When I get home, things will be so much better. I'll be in my, my safe space at home. Got home. Uh, I even like Jacksonville is, I don't know, five and a half hour drive for me. Uh, as soon as my match was over in Jacksonville, I jumped in my car. I drove through the night and got home. I think I got home at like 2 a.m. I jumped in bed and I was like, babe, I don't know what's going on. This is freaking me out, but you know, whatever. And so I lay in bed and like, I don't know, a jolt went through my brain and I could not cut it off and I couldn't close my eyes. And I started freaking out. Like I sat up and my heart was racing. And at the time she had this weighted blanket and I was like, okay, well, I've heard that that helps with anxiety. Put it on me, please. And so she puts it on me less than a second later I'm throwing it off I'm like no 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 you know, like I, I lose it um and so I, I don't know I, I I call like I, throughout the next few weeks I called like four doctors um you know and I'm so lucky that we work for the company we work for uh because I was able to talk to Doc Sampson day and night um I don't know if you remember um Dr. DeQuino from WWE mm -hmm. um but he was a friend of mine on Facebook and he saw that I was going through some issues with sleeping because I posted on Facebook, like, has anybody ever had insomnia? Because I think I have it. Uh, what did you do to go to sleep? And he called me and dude, day and night, again, he would answer my texts or call me or whatever. Um, and then I talked to two other doctors uh, and it was just, that was the, the tipping point. Um, but then, you know, um, thankfully I wasn't hard headed enough to, to, noticed something was wrong so i had to i started th therapy yeah and um through therapy i found out this is something that's been going on for a while wow so yeah. like in terms of it going on for a while it was just something that was like kind of building and building and then you you broke i think so i that's kind of what you know through talking with my therapist for a couple of months that's what we found out and dude when i i don't know when i found out you know, that there was where the issue came from, it almost like freed me a little bit. And that sounds kind of corny, but like it did, it almost freed me. Yes. Um, realized, okay, at least I know there was a starting point. It didn't just happen. Do, can you say what it was that, that yeah. was sort of like this, 
seedling for it? Yeah, so um, I guess four and a half years ago, well, four years ago, just a couple of weeks ago, um, Maria had a miscarriage. Oh. And I remember we, me and her and Finley, we, we still lived in Orlando and we were going to the mall and she hadn't felt good all day. And she was like, I just, I don't, I don't feel, I don't feel right, but let's just go to the mall. And she kept like telling me how she didn't feel right. And I said, you know what, let's go to the hospital or let's go to the doctor or whatever it was. And let's just the ER and uh, let's get you checked out. So you don't, you know, you're not worried about it. And then we'll go on about our day. So we went there, she checked in and she sat down and they, they said, uh, Maria Harwood. And as soon as she stood up, um, she lost everything. And, uh, she ran to the bathroom and I followed her in there and, uh, she had our little, little, little tiny baby in her hand. And, um, I remember obviously, uh, I had to be like fucking strong for her, you know, like she is, she, she is so broken. And she was so worried and so upset and so scared and so embarrassed, all these other emotions she was going through. Um, so like I had to be strong for her. So I didn't want to, I didn't want her to see me worried or upset, you know, mm -hmm. um, because she had so much to worry about. Oh my God. And, and uh, so <clears throat> I hit all that stuff when I would drive to, when I would drive to the performance center or whatever, I would break down almost every day. And it, it, it was one of these things where I'd break down and I would question God uh, because I had, and I do now have a relationship with God, but I questioned, and I said, God, why, you know, why did you do this to us? And just give me an answer. And I never was mad or angry, but, but I just wanted to know why this happened to us. Uh, and so years passed by and like um, little, I don't know, little things would happen. And I would say, why God, why did you do this to us? You know, just whatever it was. And then it got to the point where, like, I would be in the car and I would drop my wallet, you know, and I didn't know I was mad, but I was mad at something. And it stemmed from that. And I would say, why the fuck are you doing this to me? You know? Yeah. And so when I could just reach down and bend and pick my wallet up on my phone and put it right back in my pocket. Um, and then <laughs> uh, it got to the point where I was like, you're not even real. Like, I don't even believe in you. You're not real. So, like, something would happen and I would say, why? You know, like, you're not even real. You know, like you're not even real. Leave me alone. Um, and then that that stuff happened in uh, Jacksonville. And I think what happened was so much stuff just piled up. Mm -hmm. And that one moment where I couldn't sleep just boiled over, and I lost it. And um, oh God. I couldn't understand it. Uh, and it was just it was the scariest thing I've ever been, and the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life was go through. That. I'm so sorry you guys went through that. I can't imagine what that's like. And yeah, I mean, I, I understand the concept of like wanting to be strong and wanting to make sure that Maria's okay, make sure Finley's okay, and to take on that burden. And you're suppressing all these emotions or handling them kind of yourself um, on those car drives, like you were saying, and having those moments of breaking down. But like, God, it's it really is crazy when you, you know, you try to think of, what our capacities are of like what we can handle and how you can like put certain things aside or put things on the back burner and then stuff always ends up creeping up and it will catch up to you. Yeah. And, and I, that's, you know, exactly what happened. Like, not that I would suppress things, um, but like I would, I would just get angry and I, you know, I would go to AW and I told Dan this, like I would go to AW and I'd want people to think I was angry. You know, yeah. uh, I want them to not approach me. Um, and I, I would, I, I don't know. I felt some kind of comfort in being miserable for some reason. Sure. Misery loves you company know? as they say, right? Yeah. yeah. And then, and, uh, I don't know. I lost friendships and, and, and probably didn't make relationships that would have been good for me because I felt that way. And, um, you know, again, I, I don't want to preach or anything, but like, uh, one day, uh, this was just, it, it was, this lasted for a few months and I couldn't sleep or I was scared to go to sleep at night. Um, and I said, God, look, I know you're up there. I know you're there. You've got to be there. Please, please, please just take over and, 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 and heal me because, man, this was ruining, it was crippling. It was ruining my life. Uh, again, I'm not here to preach, but the very next day, um, things started lightening up, lightening up for me. That's when I realized the 
you know, where it started from. And then little by little, uh, I started breaking the walls down for, for, um, for my anxiety and slowly things started getting better. Um, wow. Very- how much when you, so with therapy and talking to somebody, how much of that helped you alongside sort of having your own moments of discovery and your, you know, the, the conversations you were having with yourself or the conversations that you were having with God, um, with the therapy, how much did that play into helping you figure out how to manage this? Yeah. Oh my God. I can't, I can't put a measurement on it. You know what I mean? Like it helped. It was immeasurable for the help. that. What did you think about therapy before getting in a situation where you needed it? So, um, Maria has suffered through anxiety for, for a very, very long time since the, since the, the, um, the, um, oh my God, why can't I think? Miscarriage. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, she suffered, but, but she Im- immediately recognized it. Um, and, uh, God, I think, um, this goes along hand in hand with the God thing because he put her in my life for a reason. And without her, there's no way I would have got through this. Oh my God. She is the best human being in the world. And uh, ooh, I'm fucking lucky to have her. Uh, but therapy, yeah. Um, I, uh, without her, I wouldn't have gone through therapy because I, was, I would have been embarrassed. Um, we started therapy and, um, and I was like, well, you know, why? Because again, Southern guy, we have our, our own things that you know we hear and we're taught this is another thing like i don't want them to hear but like you know uh we thought as southerners especially southern men that therapy meant you're going crazy um and so when maria told me she was gonna she's gonna go into therapy i'm like why you know are you not happy and she said no i just want someone to talk to and i'm like well you can talk to me but no no i want someone i can talk to who (laughs) understands what i'm going through and can listen to me i was like okay i get that (laughs) um so uh, without her, I would have been super embarrassed and never would have done it. Without her, I would have never got on medication because I was so embarrassed to take medication. I've never, you know, aside from surgeries and stuff, I've never like taken pain pills or done drugs or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she had to tell me, hey, this medication was made for you. It, it was made to help you, you know, like there that take it and the bad rep it gets is from the people who take this medication all day to stay high and drink with it and stuff like that that that's where the bad reputation for the medication comes from it's made for you to make you feel better and without her telling me that almost every single day um i don't know if i would have taken the medication and it did medication also gave me my life you know helped me it was one of the you know steps to help me but like you know, taking Zoloft and taking Klonopin, um, you know, all these things I've heard either for, for crazy people or for junkies or whatever. So that, that was, that was the idea that I had But for her sit down every single day, whether it was hours or, or just minutes a day to say, look, Hey, it's okay for you to feel this way. And it's okay for you to take this. Uh, I would have, I would have never done it, but, um, it's really crazy um, the the lack of education that we can have on these things and the stereotypes that come with them that yeah. kind of ingrained they get ingrained in our brains from kind of you know a pretty young age. So it's it's really interesting now to like yeah to be on the other side of it and to break down those stereotypes and not feel like you know that yeah taking these drugs or going to a therapist is for a crazy person. It's like no these things exist for a reason. Yeah. and lean into that and get the help that you need instead of I guess like kind of choosing to suffer or you think that you can deal with things yourself or you think that it's going to go away or it'll eventually just get better um that can obviously be such a slippery dangerous slope that people yeah. can find themselves in so I feel like once you first get that inkling of like oh shit I maybe need to get some help here um and I think guys like you being able to to talk about this stuff really helps a lot of other people that could be in a similar situation and have that same thought process. I hope so, especially for men. Um, mm-hmm. because again, so, you know, we're all, where, wherever you come from, you know, we're all taught to be prideful, you know, yeah. whether directly or indirectly, we're taught to be prideful. And, uh, I was the same way. My dad, you know, 
was very proud of the fact that he was a, I mean, I say a single father. My mom was there too, just as much, but he was a single father. He was cooking for us. He was cleaning for us. He, you know, he worked his ass off at a hard job that I, there's no way I could ever do it. But, but he was prideful that he was, he was able to provide for us like that. Um, you know, and so he instilled that in me indirectly. Uh, and so even when I told him, hey, I'm, I think I'm going to go to therapy. He, why, why, why do you want to go to therapy? You know, what, 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 why? I could explain to him all day about my anxiety issues, but he didn't understand the therapy part. So yeah, as a man, um, I hope that I'm able to continue to share my story to let other guys know, like, it's okay. Like if you're weak, that's okay. Um, because I was the weakest of weak. There was no one in that little bit, that period of time, no one in this world was weaker than me. And I am just uh, lucky and fortunate that I could recognize that and recognize that, hey man, I'm not, I'm not strong enough to do this myself and lucky and fortunate <clears throat> enough to have a perfect wife that took care of me and made sure that um, I took the right steps. <clears throat> and whenever I was scared to go to sleep, because that was, that was it, that was my anxiety, to sleep. I was scared yeah. to fall asleep. Um, she would say, I'll stay up with you all night. I don't care. Like, I'll be here for you. And she would, man. God, they, she would stay up till two in the morning until we contort our bed. Like, we have, like, the, the, the gimmick bed that moves and stuff. We contort it to get me, like, these weird positions. And you can, you can vibrate and stuff. And then she'd cover me with these, these covers. And she'd give me all these lavender oils and, uh, you know, all these homeopathic things. Uh, and she would stay up with me until I finally passed out and she would go to sleep and she would sleep four hours a night too, just to make sure that I felt okay. Uh, and I, yeah, she's the best. So yeah. So having a therapist is good, but having a Maria is better, I guess. Oh my God. I mean, you know, obviously you love your wife very much and it's so nice to hear, you know, just like your relationship with your wife and with your daughter and the man that you are. I mean, you are, a, you, the things that you love, you love oh, yeah. family professional wrestling i mean i think those things um are definitely some of the, like the, the pillars that that make you up um but yeah to, to have a partner that is understanding because you know being on the other side of things can be really difficult sometimes when you're trying to understand what somebody else is going through and you're trying to walk in in their shoes while also still trying to keep a household afloat so I think being able to have a great partner is, um, yeah, I can't say enough about that. Yeah. And, uh, outside of a great wife partner, uh, my God, cash was the same, like incredible. You know, he was, <clears throat> he was so understanding and you're, you're exactly right. Like if I love something, I fucking love it. Yeah. So it's not a good, sometimes not a good degree, like wrestling. I love it so much, too much, um, to the point where like, that's, was part of my anxiety too. Um, like I remember the match we were having with the Bucks. Uh, I couldn't sleep for two weeks because I was scared that I wasn't going to be able to deliver the match that these fans had wanted for six years. And so I would stay up all night and think of things and I cried to Maria. God damn, I, I, people are going to have this whole new outlook on who I am. And I would cry to Maria because I'm like, I can't, I can't get this match together. And I pride myself on being able to, to, to be the ring general. You know, I, I'm very prideful of that. And I could not get this match together. Um, but, you know, like you said, like my family and, and wrestling and, you know, and God too. But those two things, the, the love that I have for them um, make me, uh, it, it makes me, I wear my emotions on my sleeve because of that. And sometimes that's a good thing because uh, I'm too uh, serious and too prideful and, and love wrestling too much that sometimes it can drive people away. With Dan too, uh, Cash, fucking incredible partner who understood what I was going through, checked on me every single day, um, stood up for me, um, you know, and told me, hey, we're ready when you're ready. You know, yeah. he was incredible. Uh, that's so cool. It's, it's, it's really nice, like, when you know who your people are and to have that bit of like a safe house to be in, I mean, whether it's like the actual physical thing or the people that you know that you can rely on, uh, always good to have those old faithfuls. It's crazy. I, I always assumed that you two knew each other before getting into WWE. How did you guys develop this, uh, this beautiful harmony amongst the two of you? 
<laughs> well, we knew of each other, um, but I lived on the coast of North Carolina and he lived here in the mountains. Um, so we knew of each other because in North Carolina, uh, the, the good talent is very few and far between. So we had always heard of each other and we had like communicated through each other, to each other through like Facebook and things like that. And hope one day we get to meet each other and hope we get to work together. Um, but yeah, the first time we actually physically met was at, um, at the WWE show that Regal booked me on. And Dan had been trying his hardest to get signed for years. And they would like, they booked him so much that the wrestlers thought he was signed. Like they thought, because he traveled so much with yeah. them. Um, and we met and we started, we were, we were so happy to meet each other. And we had talked again through Facebook and we we're like, hey, let's travel together on this loop um, that we were booked on. And so I said, uh, the first thing I said to him was like, hey, very nice to meet you. I said, are you a Brett or a Sean guy? He said, oh, I'm a Brett guy. I said, oh, <laughs> who I love. And from then, we became fast friends. What was it like for you guys to help get Edge ready for his return? Uh, I was, when, when, so he, he called us the way before it was even thought of, you know, he was okay. Um, and so he wanted to test it out. We have been friends with Adam for a very long time. Um, but he called both of us and he said, Hey, there, there's not too many people in wrestling that I trust. Uh, I would love for you guys to come to Dr. Tom's and, uh, work around with me. He said, I know you won't take it easy on me and I need to know if I'm actually going to be able to do this. So it was a, it was, you know, obviously an honor as much as a, a, a friend as he is to us. Um, I always tell him like, it never, it never, um, it never goes away that a hero who is a friend, but a hero of mine wants us to work with him or help him get ready or comes to see rock and roll express versus FTR or calls us ever him and Randy are having the greatest match of all time. They called us, Randy called us to meet them and put this match together with them. Oh, wow! So like we offered, we would give them ideas of what we would do and, you know, uh, spots we would think of and, and we would go through uh, scenarios with them. Um, and the same with Beth, like her and Natty as well. When Beth was coming back to team with Natty, called me and Dan to work tag team matches with her and Natty before, you know, before she yeah. made re debut, I guess. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was, like, it was like, And you mentioned Randy as well. You guys have a, a pretty unique relationship with Randy Orton. How did that come about? He's, he can be a bit of a tough nut to crack, uh, but yeah. I love me some Randy Orton. Yeah, um, he, uh, he is incredible. I don't, I don't know if, there, no, there was no one else in WWE who fought harder for us than Randy. Uh, maybe Roman, uh, you know, was a close second, but Randy fought super hard for us. Um, this, the whole FTRKO thing wasn't supposed to be a thing um, because uh, Vince did not like uh, five ten Southerners, uh, but <clears throat> um, it just worked. It, 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 and you know, it it worked. We worked together. And so we worked a few house shows together and uh, he was so impressed with myself and Dan being able to call stuff in the ring. He was like, man, I haven't worked like that in 15 years because things changed so much. It, it went from a wrestling product to a television product. And he was so impressed with that. And we got along on the tour buses and stuff. And it was just, um, it was just easy. You know, uh, I think he's a wrestling fan. Um, even though he didn't grow up as a wrestling fan, he's a wrestling fan. He sees that we're huge wrestling fans. So we kind of bonded over that and asked him questions about his dad. Um, and he saw how hard we worked and he loved that. Um, and then just outside of that, we were just, yeah, we were just, I don't know. It, it's so weird because of who he is, what he is, who we are and what we are. You would think we're polar opposites and maybe we are, but uh, it made for a great friendship. And we still yeah. talk to this day. It was a lot of fun to watch. It was like, wait, what? What's happening here? I like this. I like this. I like this budding friendship. Yeah. <laughs> Those us boots. Too. Those snakeskin boots. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, and of course, we all know that you're a huge Bret Hart fan who's not. Come on. The excellence of execution. Oh, um, what's your deal with HBK? Uh, <laughs> um, personally. We don't if you want to talk about it, cool. If you don't, totally fine as well. I've never talked about it before, but fuck it. Why not? You know what I mean? Um, so obviously as a kid, you either had to be a Brett or a Sean. And uh, 
I've said this many a times, Brett has this, uh, he is over in a unique way. He's not Hulk Hogan over and he's not Steve Austin over, you know what I mean? He's not the biggest star in wrestling history, but the way he was over is so unique that it's never been replicated. And it may not ever. People feel for him to this day. I, and I do too. Like, you can call me a mark if you want. I don't give a damn. Uh, but I'm the motherfucker that's texting him on a weekly basis because we're friends. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but he made me, as a kid, he made me feel a certain way. Uh, and I think that's why I wrestle and, and cash too. We wrestle the way we do because I never, I, I love the, the, like, I love the cruiserweights and stuff. And this, this stuff is, was incredible. But Brett made me feel a certain way. And I want to make people feel that way too. Um, emotionally, not loving. They're never going to love me as much as love Brett. But um, emotional, I want an emotional connection in every match we have. Uh, just like he had. And so uh, as a kid, I chose Brett over Sean. Um, and then in uh, NXT, uh, Sean came on board and he was a, you know, he was um, a teacher and he was a big fan of me and Dan's. And I was, and I, I even put a Facebook status up that says, maybe I'll forgive Sean. Uh, but just out of nowhere. And uh, we got injured. I, I, uh, Dan broke his jaw, uh, Kenta, Gave him to go to sleep, broke his jaw. Maybe two weeks later, I gave Seamus a lifter and I broke my or tore my bicep. And um, I went through a real bad phase then because, you know, I was like, man, this is not going to work for us. I mean, this is a run of bad luck. And uh, we came back to TV. And then at Raw 25, we were booked to do the deal with Hunter and his friends where they just beat us up. And I was so upset because for a lot of guys it's like oh it's, it's a paycheck who cares but not to me like there's a legacy i want to leave on wrestling you know if i if i come into wrestling and there's nothing left behind um then i didn't do what i wanted to do what i set out to do uh but that happened and i talked to sean and that was the first time we talked since um the pc days and uh i told him like i was like man uh this happened tore my bicep i went through a really dark period i thought i was going to quit um, I said, but thankfully, just like I've told you, I had the greatest wife in the world and she has supported me and she's brought me out of this funk and like she brought me out of a dark place and I'm here now and I'm super happy. Uh, he said, I was the same way. I was in this very dark spot. I met my wife. She's beautiful. Uh, and she pulled me out of this dark spot too. And I was like, oh, that's so awesome. He said, look, you and your partner are way too talented to be doing what you're doing tonight. You're way too talented to stay at this point. Just keep your nose to the ground and keep grinding and you're going to get over. I'm like, oh man, Sean, thank you so much. And so we had this bonding moment, right? And then we got in front of his friends, uh, X-Pac and Hunter and Billy and Road Dog and Scott. And as soon as we got in front of his friends, he started making fun of me and making fun of my situation and what happened with my bicep. And I was like, man, I just poured my heart out to you. And because we're going over what you know they're going to beat the shit out of us uh you decide to take all that stuff and make fun of me about it and i never ever forgot it and um as soon as we were done with the the business at raw one person said thank you to us and it was sean waltman everyone else was so cold to us and treated us like we were just like the shit on the bottom of their shoes except for Sean Waltman. And I'll never forget that for Sean. And I hope that there's a day we, that comes that we can have a conversation and sit down and I can ask him why he did that. Um, and we can reconcile if he wants to. Uh, but yeah, uh, if I feel it, if I love you, I love you. Uh, if I don't, I don't. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, that's a really interesting story. I had no idea where that was gonna go or what the situation was gonna be, but um it's interesting how things like that happen. I mean, it's like some classic schoolyard shit, right? Yeah. And it was, just, it was just to look cool in front of his friends who already think he's the fucking coolest guy in the world. Right. So why? Yeah. And as much as I love Brett, like, man, I look up to you too. Like, come on. You did. Yeah. But hey, uh, I got over it. We've got over it. And uh, we're on the other side of that now. And we're writing our own legacy. So I'm very happy about that. Well, listen, I've taken up a ton of your time. So I'm going to end with one final question. That's hopefully an upper. Um, okay. When do we get to see FTR versus the Briscoe brothers? Oh my God. What a <laughs> bubble, dude. 
Uh, oh my God. I wish I knew the answer. Um, I would do it yesterday if they let one paid as well, you know, uh, we showed up and you know, there's wrestling and then there's real life. And, uh, I think in real life, they think that they're uh, better than us as a tag team, which is so cool. That's fine. You think that way uh, because we met them before and they were cool, but, uh, I think they had this, uh, perception of who we were and who we are. Um, but they think that they're the best tag team and they think they're better than us, I think. And on the other side of that coin, uh, there's not a better tag team in the world than us. I tweeted it out this morning. Um, someone said, who, who, uh, who tells this guy the best? Uh, they, that shit needs to stop. And I said, okay, well, I'll tell Brett, Steve Austin, Edge, Christian, Rock and Roll Express, Midnight Express, Jim Cornette. I'll tell them all that you're right and they're wrong. Um, but there's some underlying you know, uh, real life tension, I think. Um, and I think that's what may be stopping it from happening for right now, uh, because we are the best. They think they're the best. Um, and I don't know if either team wants to, uh, I'm trying to say this as kayfabe as possible, but wants to back down from that. Right. Um, you know, and In hopefully- In classic wrestling terms, can they coexist? Can they coexist, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I hope that we're able to do business in the future because we've had promoters, uh, and I don't want to sound like I'm patting myself in the back, but we've had promoters offer us a crazy amount of money for this match. Uh, astronomical amount of money. I could never. Well, everyone even... thought you guys were going to show up at Hammerstein. Yeah, I don't know why they booked that like that. Like, no, you, you know, why? Why would you say a mystery team? <laughs> Everybody's going to think it's us, not us. Um, I don't know. That's a question. Whenever you have Tony on the show, you ask Tony Khan. Ask him what. Hey, great. I will have a follow up with Tony then. I'll try to get to the my bottom next, of it with him. My next question is when we're going to have uh, us versus the Young Bucks again? Because. God, I, I think they forgot we worked there. Well, it's time to remind everybody. Let's uh, let's keep reminding everybody. Does it feel hard to, I mean, it seems like this is kind of an ongoing uh, battle. There's just so many people trying to get TV time all the time. I mean, what? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean we, you know, we've got a stacked roster and, and I have to, and Cash has to tell me, Dan has to tell me every week, hey, relax. Like, you know, there's not time for everybody. Uh, and you know, but then when we get the opportunity to have a fucking banger with CM Punk and John Moxley, you have a fucking banger with CM Punk and John Moxley, which yeah. put me on your show right after you kicked me in my mouth and busted open. But, uh, but, yes. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, so if we get, you know, I'm trying to learn to take my love for professional wrestling and, and, uh, put it in a positive direction. So, uh, if we don't get booked the way that we think we should be booked, that's okay. Uh, because we'll always be here. And if you need a fucking 20 or 30 minute banger, uh, a classic for television, give us a call and we'll be right there and we'll deliver every single time. Hell yeah. Uh, well, dude, it's been so good having you on here and talking to you and just getting to hear this other side of you that, uh, you know, nobody ever really knows until you are able to talk about things like this. And uh, I really do think that it goes a really long way for, for a guy in your position to, uh, to explain some of these things to, to anyone else that might be going through a similar situation. Thanks, dude. I appreciate you having me on. Let me talk about that stuff and oh you know, nonstop talk about my wife and daughter and life. <laughs> Rotten days. Do you remember that or no? With the what days? Possum trotting day. You don't remember that when we first met. Dude, come on. It was the our first possum trotting days. Remember the song? You got to ask Tyler Breeze. The, the, the song I made up. <laughs> they were interviewing me in front of the green screen. And they were doing oh the. Oh my God. Yes. I remember uh, that. Uh, girl, this is my girl. Oh my oh God. Oh my yeah. God. I, yes. Oh my God. Wait. And then what was the other didn't we come up with like some weird stupid name or we were doing Stanielle or something like that oh yeah yeah Stanielle <laughs> right yeah <laughs> get up this song on the fly and I just started singing it oh man Surprise I me remember I was oh my god that was a long time ago yeah 2013 it must have been yeah oh my god yeah I actually I just like mentally dropped into that day I can picture us I actually what? like remember I was wearing like a New York Knicks shirt and I like specifically remember that day now. Here we are. See, just had to jog my memory quickly. I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> and then, look where 
oh my God, we're both parents and making a living, doing what we love. Oh, life is so How lucky. How lucky, honestly. I mean, you've got your family that you love. I've got my family that I love. You get to just like, yeah, it's existing and growing and learning and it's the best. We're very lucky. Every single day that I'm the luckiest man in the world. I really am. Here we are. Just, you know, hitting threes, left, right, and center. (laughs) (laughs) No net, bitches. (laughs) All right, I will let you get back to your beautiful family. But I, again, yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and being so honest and telling your story. Thanks, dude. I'm sure I will uh, message you later, but I appreciate you having me on and talking. My dude. See ya.